Conversation is a part of our celebratory exhibition 45 at 45, celebrating L.A. Louvre's 45 year history in Venice. Today, we'll take a look at the history of the gallery and the development and construction of its iconic building. I'm Kimberly Davis. I'm director of the gallery since 1985, along with Peter. While I've been asked to make an introduction of these two men, I believe all of you in our audience today know who they are. And if you don't, you will by the end of this talk. So I'll proceed with a brief introduction as there is an extraordinary journey ahead in their conversation about the history of the gallery, the art and architecture world, and the collaborative effort required to make it all happen. When I joined LA Louvre in 1985, the gallery was small, but still had two locations in Venice for exhibitions. We were originally a staff of five, and everyone was on board to do everything required to make it a success. The 80s were a boom time, and Peter and I, working together, were young, ambitious, and ready to grow. Our staff and exhibition program grew. We opened a gallery in New York hoping to bring our point of view of Los Angeles artists in an international context to the big city. And although we were successful, respected by our peers in US and abroad, we never fully integrated into the provincial New York art scene. We closed the gallery in the early 90s to concentrate on our core business and the building of our new space. Early on, it was decided we needed to have one working gallery in Venice instead of the six disparate spaces we had grown into plus New York. Today's conversation will give you that history in visuals along with a lively conversation um, between Fred's early work in Venice, working with artists and in the development of their spaces for working and showing their art. All of that made perfect sense to Peter. They both shared an aesthetic of how things should look, classic room proportions, excellent light, flexible spaces for showing art at its best. It's a collaborative effort to make it all work. Both teams, ours at LA Louvre and Fred's amazing colleagues worked together well. Thank you to all. For today's presentation, we particularly thank our communications manager, Christina Carlos and archivist, Alia Kala, who've assembled all the images illustrating ours and Fred's history to give you a better understanding of what it took to make it work. Thank you, Fred. Every day, it's a pleasure to work in our building. I love the north light in the skylight in my office. People marvel at its simplicity, sophistication, and all the wonderful details. We look forward to sharing with all of you the exhibition 45 at 45 in January, which due to our current restrictions will be extended till the end of January if everything goes well. Please make an appointment online uh, You'll be able to in January, I hope. And I know you'll enjoy the experience. So now I turn it over to Peter and Fred and say, thank you very much. Enjoy everyone. Look forward to seeing you soon. Bye. Thanks, Kimberly. Yeah, thank you, Kimberly. It's really good that Kimberly made the introduction, Fred, because uh, aside from the fact we've worked together for 35 years, uh, we started thinking about the, um, the idea of building a uh, a new space in 1985. So we've been at this together ever since. Still it's amazing. Yeah. So meanwhile, we started in our space next door. Um, this was the original location at 55 North Venice Boulevard. And then we mounted exhibitions in this neighborhood accordingly. Why did we choose Venice? It's because actually if you start at Ocean Boulevard, which is due north, and you go down to Washington Boulevard, and you go from the Pacific, um, from the um, Speedway back to Lincoln, in that rectangle, virtually every artist in, in Los Angeles lived and worked. The exceptions were those who lived in Laurel Canyon, like the Saar family and Keenholz, um, or those out in Pasadena around Water Hops. Uh, later becoming uh, Bruce Nauman and Pashkin and Max Cole, you remember, and so on and so forth. Um, the artists lived and worked inexpensively. So I thought we could open in a space in the neighborhood where perhaps an audience had been overlooked. 
where other artists live and work, visitors come and go, collectors, co uh, curators, writers, other artists. It's actually a, 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 a lively scene to plug into, and this is what we did. Rather inexpensively, we could open in this neighborhood and have an audience as long as we had something worthwhile to say. So this is how we utilize that uh, small space. It was only, I can't even remember how many square feet. Do you remember? Was it 1,200 square feet? Something like that. And this is, um, this is what we, uh, this is how we started. A lot of our connections at the beginning were through UCLA where I taught. And this particular show, which was the most ambitious at that point, the goal of the gallery was to show Los Angeles-based artists or California-based artists in an international context. It was not being done. So by 1979, we were open for four years, three and a half years. Um, we were able to put together a rather complex exhibition of 10 British figurative painters, a show that David Hockney said couldn't be done. The politics were too complicated to pull it off. But we did it in two parts because 10 artists couldn't be seen in the space all at once. And I realized then that up ahead, we'd need a much larger space. Well, it doesn't be much larger, we'd need more efficient space to attract artists if we were credible to continue. So our second space opened next, which was on Market Street. And this is how Market Street looked at that time doesn't look that much different today, but the wood was uh, the facade of Larry Bell's studio. And I think we have a shot of Larry in the studio. On that street were at least four or five other artists, Robert Irwin, um, Dwayne Valentine, uh, others came and go, Charlie Ray had a place on the street, just on one short half block street. And that's how the whole neighborhood was. And to a certain extent still is. And then um, we converted this space, which had to have this facade. We kept the big doors that Larry designed, adapted them, because we had some interests of our own to bring larger work into the gallery. And we did the initial show in the gallery, fittingly, of Larry's work. Not just the sculpture, but also furniture, lighting, and all those areas of interest that are essential to his aesthetic. And then um, the space was used in a variety of ways. You can see now and Keen Holtz. And, and in fact, we brought a major Keen Holtz show into the gallery and, and utilized these enormous doors to accomplish this. This little short film that was taken at the time. You can see Nancy in the foreground, there's Ed. And that's the studio assistant, Tom. And we brought this enormous piece in which we can cut away to have a look at how that looked at in the, in the gallery. But without that space, we could never have done a show like, like this one, for example. Our workspace is um, developed. So we were now working out of six disparate quarters in the neighborhood. And perhaps Fred, you could uh, tell us what you saw when you came to study it. <laughs> Well, I moved to Venice about the same time and uh, really uh, in part because of its uh, wonderful diversity and the amount of creative people there. I knew a number of the artists uh, and people in uh, publishing and uh, photography and des graphic design and including um, uh, Lauren Kaplan, who was uh, who is a writer and was the publisher of Wet Magazine, one of the the premier, you know, cultural uh, uh, expressions of uh, Venice and and Los Angeles at the time, and uh, that was my very first. Uh, my two very first commissions were first uh, Lauren Kaplan's house um, on uh, San Juan Avenue, and uh, which is just a couple of blocks from the gallery. And I lived on Superba Avenue, again, just a few blocks away. And uh, we loved living in Venice at the time, the community that was there, and uh, the fact that, you know, on my, I don't know, at the time, $8 an hour salary, uh, 
uh, working at Frank Gehry's office, I could buy a house in Venice. And um, uh, so I spent countless hours at, at Louvre Gallery and at the few other galleries uh, uh, that were coming in. And uh, that was my milieu. It was the, the, the artists, uh, people like, you know, I don't know, Guy Dill, for example, uh, lived a couple of blocks away from us um, and, and others. And the, um, the, the patrons or the, the, the commissioners of architecture like Lauren Kaplan and uh, creative, uh, other creative people like Leonard Corrin, who was the, the editorial uh, uh, wisdom behind Wet Magazine. Uh, some Elizabeth Freeman, uh, some serious business, environmental communications. Uh, there was it, it, Venice was a, an incredibly uh, 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 vital uh, creative community at the time, and I just loved being in the middle of it. And my other other first commission uh, was uh, immediately after the Kaplan House, which is I, I I love that that project. I would say that it has the characteristics of of a first of an architect's first project is that you try to put every single idea you've ever had into it. Um, and it was wonderful, but very complex and just loaded with metaphors and shapes and, and uh, materials. And then I went to work for Elsa Rady, um, who was a sublime artist in porcelain. And her work had, had an incredible pre precision. She was a renowned uh, renowned for her colored glazes. And she was not interested in any architectural expression. She wanted a beautiful environment where she could work and that where her work would look beautiful and not be competed with or overwhelmed um, by the environment. <clears throat> and so I, that little project was really important to me. It was a turning point and where Elsa kind of enforced a, you know, a real cleansing and editing of my, my outlook. And uh, the notion that the architecture is a frame to support the art experience. And that was really a part of, of our initial conversations, Peter. And um, the, the focus that really the art comes first. And, uh, and also you, like I was, completely taken with the light of of not just Los Angeles but of Venice in particular and which was very influential um, right around that a little bit later than that um, Robert Irwin did his legendary piece um, uh, where he took the front off of a building on Windward Avenue and um, it's on Market Street actually oh I'm sorry you're right Market Street right up where the second gallery was located yeah, and the and the 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 artwork the artwork was the light itself, and um, I think that's one of the things that that you and I always loved about being in Venice, and um, uh, about and that was a, 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 an important driving uh, theme in the gallery conception. Very much so. Well, I was attracted to your work for the dialogue taking place in the neighborhood, and when I came to understand about you and your work. And I thought you could examine our spaces in such a way that they could be translated by you and study the ergonomics perhaps of our spaces so you could come up with not an expansion is what we were not looking forward to. <clears throat> we were looking forward to a consolidation. So that's essentially what, uh, what we set about doing. So you came in and you studied our way of working. And uh, these are some of the images which Christine is going to chomp through here to give you what Fred had to look at. And I interviewed several architects, not interviewed, I met and got acquainted with several architects, including James Sterling from the United Kingdom, he was Scotsman. And I went to the Aspen Design Conference in 86 to meet him. And he certainly wanted to do the project, but the complexities of working with architects from far away was too challenging a thought. And besides which, I thought that you understood the area better than anyone. And so we came together in 97. Let's, and look at how things were. <laughs> to see these images now is astonishing. It took me ages to work out where that was. <laughs> well, that was one of the, the parts of the process, which I would say 
I've been practicing for almost 40 years. And I, I don't think there's a, a single client that had a, a more rigorous grasp of his own operation and a ability to imagine out of the chaos of those six spaces and, and the ad hoc way of moving in and functioning, um, you could imagine this I kind of ideal working uh, um, arrangement. And uh, the co many, many conversations were fascinating to me. And I learned a lot about uh, the gallery business um, and about the really the subtleties of, of human interaction and human experience, and as well as the more utilitarian aspects of library, storage space, art moving, uh, and lighting and uh, subtleties of finishes and details and things like that. And it was a really thrilling uh, conversation to create this. It wasn't, uh, to me, it was very unusual within our practice and, and how hands-on you were and how uh, you could imagine in your own head. And I think I, 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 I know that you did have an interest in yourself in architecture and um, I, I think that that showed in your ability to imagine the space that you wanted to have. Well, you're very kind. Um, <laughs> thank you. You guided me very well. Now we come to Fred's, uh, this is how we began with Fred. Well, this is a, a, the kind of, I mean, I still do these kinds of things. This is a watercolor. And um, I, I came of age in the, in the analog uh, period, drawing with hand and, and brush and, uh, so I like to, to think about the essence of projects and uh, 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 create an image for that. And this is the one to me was the essential character of L.A. Louvre Gallery, which is of a series of spaces for showing art and of, of kind of searching for not a uniform uh, one size fits all space, but a suite of spaces that Peter developed with those six locations and to and the wide variety of work that is shown in the galleries program uh, needed a variety of spaces and then there's a variety of purposes from the grand public uh, main public gallery at the bottom uh, to the private showing area uh, on the top and so that the heart of the gallery really is this suite of of white boxes and the light, the differences in light and proportion and view from them. Okay. And then the drawings, uh, again, uh, done by hand. And uh, so the- This is a nice uh, one. Yeah. This really yeah. shows in the map on the top, that's quite literally the perimeter of that neighborhood, more or less, this is perhaps mm -hmm. a, a quarter again further up, but that's all. And here is your concept for um, developing boxes. Yeah, and it was a it was a very tight fit. It, there's a, <laughs> a strict height limit of two stories on that property, and uh, when we added everything else, it, everything else up, it actually didn't fit on those two stories. And um, there was a concept that Peter had in his mind from his past, maybe he'll talk a little bit about it, about a, a sky gallery. And that, uh, and this notion of, in a way that what the gallery does is it gives something to the community. It, it, I mean, the remarkable thing about galleries is that you can go to a private gallery and see museum quality art shows for nothing. And uh, they're a, you know, a, a, in addition to being a business, they're a tremendous public service. And so this scheme and response to all these restrictions was to take advantage of this notion that Peter had of the skylit space and an idea of essentially offering a, an outdoor gallery to the public. And then in negotiations with the building department, zoning department allowed us to create the third floor offices and essentially as a trade-off of spaces, which allowed Peter to have his uh, you know, office in the sky 
and with this incredible view of the mountains and of the ocean and the sky. Oh, yeah. So, you know, the, you can see here, it just goes from, from property line to property line. Um, and uh, it was a very tight, not easy to build in a situation like that. There's no staging area. Things have to be in the street that aren't on the site. Uh, so if you could just kind of scroll through and you can see the building next door, which is where the first the gallery was. Now the original uh, uh, no, space, uh, by the yeah. way, half, half of the site was a mirror of the apartment building. So in other words, there were two apartment buildings side by side, each mirroring the other. And in order to develop this property, one had to provide equivalent housing for what you were removing. So if you remove mm -hmm. four apartments, you had to provide four apartments somewhere else. So we physically moved that apartment building, literally drove it out of the neighborhood, cut it off its foundation and put it on a new foundation in a different part of town, satisfying the requirement to do that within a mile radius of no. the original site. That's how we created the site. The mm -hmm. other was a vacant lot that was of no use, which I bought very cheaply mm -hmm. because no one could use, they used to store bathtubs in there or some such rubbish. <laughs> so that's how the original site began, but the height limitation was 30 feet, you're right. So here you see the um, the concrete block uh, a framework of of one of the galleries. This is uh, going up on the street, and then to the right of that is the space that became the other uh, the outdoor courtyard, entry courtyard, and gallery. Yeah, let's keep scrolling, Christina. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, this, this is the building up of the sky room. So then here goes, there's a, there's, a, there's a concrete block wall, then there's the concrete slab, which is the floor of the sky room. And then, then inset from that just slightly to is this the concrete block framework for the sky room. And there you see it up to its full height and then the steel framework for the building starting to go in. And filled out with the wood framing, you can see the sky, the clear story uh, windows shaping up on the upper right, and the entry door in the center, and then the the penthouse space going up on top, a little a little house up in the clouds. <laughs> and begins to be enclosed. This is simple. Uh, wood paint production. And now, so this is, if we could pause on this for uh, a minute, this was a really important uh, part of the composition of the building. Uh, art galleries are a unique building type is that in that you are really minimizing the amount of, of openings. Your, uh, your galleries need walls to hang art on. And um, with the very limited footprint, the um, uh, we had a lot of basically blank walls facing the street. And in our conversations with each other, which were very wide ranging, um, Peter mentioned this notion of a monochromatic Mondrian. And I was, I th really loved that, that image and we used that as a starting point for composing this elevation as a series of this monochromatic in a narrow, narrow range of colors from white to, to black um, and different textures of the smooth white. And that's, that's the sky room, but it was also a symbol of the whole building. It's, it's the white box. And that sat on a rusticated base. And then behind that was that kind of putty colored uh, rough uh, uh, plaster facade and then the smoother light putty colored facade around that and then the black gate and the black glass and frames of the windows and of the penthouse. So um, the, the building was really meant to be a piece of abstract sculpture on the street. So we had the opportunity with Fred to um, begin to make adjustments to previous experiences. So we worked out of two spaces, one of which was infused with natural light, that's the one on Venice Boulevard, and the other was always ambient light on Market Street. So here we take us, we took the virtues of both of those experiences and brought them into here with some adjustments. Space on Market Street was always irregular, obviously it wasn't 
custom built. And so there are two different size rooms. Here we, we created a single room, but the subtlety here was our ceiling height is 14 feet. And we at the Venice Boulevard, at the Market Street space, the height was 13 feet. That extra 12 inches meant that the, uh, that the lighting uh, cans would be above the sight line. And it's a simple thing, it's a small thing, but without that, it's constantly interrupting the viewer's vision. So here we were able to cure that. When we move on, you can see how the circulation in the building became a very important part of Fred's uh, imagination. How could he take people through essentially six different working experiences that we were, we had trained mm -hmm. ourselves to be accustomed to. And it is through the circulatory nature of the building, something that Fred might overlook mentioning, and you can already see from mm -hmm. this, and if you carry on, you can see more if you carry on to the first floor, Christina. And this, we took it, we took advantage to a, a psychological fact about humans, which is that we are phototropic, which right. means we, we moved, we moved toward the light. And yeah. so we placed the windows um, to create a series of, of, of uh, light coming in around the corner where you, you don't see it at first. You just see where the window is at first on the left, you see. The, just the light coming down the stair, you're drawn to it. And then as you move up the stairs, you see the view out. But again, it's very abstract. It's not looking out of, like out a picture window where you see everything. It's a limited framed view. And it could almost be, it could be literally a painting, an abstract painting. But it also the keeps, the, uh, it keeps the viewer's attention inside. Mm -hmm. So once you leave the noise of the street and you enter into this uh, vestibule, why? Now you're in this space and the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the most satisfying visits were those who, from people who came and, and lingered because they weren't expecting to have this unfold. If you go to the first floor, you can see here, for example, there's no ductwork. There's no invasion into the space uh, on, the, on the second floor, I meant, sorry. I'm still English, I call the first floor the second. Yeah. Anyway, there's no, uh, there are no, there's no ductwork, there's no conduits running through the space. This was deliberate. All the circulation of air and the electricity and all the things needed to power the building are within the framework of the walls. Hmm. This was yeah. a very important detail. Yeah, and we wanted to make we call it make we call it a quiet space. We wanted to 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 eliminate the visual noise, and and I think that's one of my my biggest criticisms of many uh, architect uh, designed art spaces is that they're, they're they're noisy, in in the visual sense. And given the work that that the gallery program shows, you can see that is that a McCracken on the left. Mm. Um, these are. Uh, very subtle works, and we wanted to bring make a, a, a softly lit, natural, naturally lit space. You see the skylights on top, um, and then the slot of light coming in from the facade, which in a way reminds you you're in the city. It takes you back to the city, and it it reflects a circulation spine, and it begins to lead you up the stairs to the offices on top. And then the next images show how the library developed. This is out of Kimberly's office. If we go to the next one, the, it was always intended that behind those um, veiled uh, private areas were the areas that people really wanted to get into. So these are spaces that the public could see, but they weren't allowed to come in unless invited. Once invited, we, we found clients willing to stay and linger and Here's an example of how the transit would work from one side to the other. On the left works on paper mostly, and, and on the right, the continuation of the library, which you'll see is in a developing ongoing state. So this is how we stored art this way as opposed to the way we used to. If we go on to this next image of the sky room, where we're looking down onto the sky room, there you can see this extraordinary space. And later we'll see some images of different installations done here. But what Fred was alluding to earlier was the fact this is, has no ceiling, it has no roof, it's open to the elements, therefore not a measurable square footage. So it became additional space. It wasn't built for that reason, it was built because 
I had visited Rico Mizuno in 1973, three years before I got the gallery program going, and certainly two years before I ever thought about being an art dealer. And, and, and she shared with me an experience in her gallery. Her gallery space was not that much bigger than the Sky Room, maybe half as much again. And Ed Moses had, for a summer exhibition project, and as you can see in the images you're now looking at, he took the roof off the uh, gallery room and revealed day by day elements of the sky until finally, if we go back, Christina, to that top view of the sky room, please. Because, yeah. um, if you look back on this, you see how perfectly troweled the edges are. So in Enrico's experience, Ed removed the ceiling bit by bit, took about a month or so to do that. And in that process, you see the cross hatching that later became a featured part of his painting experience, not just Navajo blankets, but to do with light and the interaction of light. But he also used uh, James Terrell, who was uh, living in the neighborhood, in fact, to act as his studio assistant to make the finishing to the edges of these, uh, at the edges of the sky room as perfect as possible. So that perhaps is where we get the beginnings of James Terrell's long career. I'm not sure, I wouldn't dream of saying that, but it does enter my mind from time to time. But the magic of this space, although I never saw her space that way, was what lingered and what Fred provided. And we went on to do all sorts of things with it. Yeah, this shows the passage of light through the gallery. Yeah, this is taking you back to the street and uh, it's just a narrow slice in the wall not to interrupt the, the exhibits and then the skylight reinforces that path and so you if you when you turn around and uh, you're drawn up the stairs again by light by the skylight pouring down and by that little window at the end and you can literally stand on the street and look through that window on the second floor and look out the end of the building uh, to the north. And um, that was a way of knitting the gallery back into the, into the city and into the sky. That journey is about 80 feet, isn't it, Fred? Yeah. yeah. So upstairs we have the offices, the way they were and the way they evolved. And the we track through these, we can see how the third floor has been adapted to over time. And then we come down to the ground floor and we see the prep area down below. That little this window is... again, a subject of conversation between uh, Peter and myself. Uh, we both were intrigued with the idea of a picture on the wall, which was a window. And so this, I think it shows that uh, how it compares to the artwork hanging on either side of it. And it could very well be a painting. Very much thought of that way. So here are some of the exhibition and how the space has been used. And of course, if we keep going here, there's no way we could ever have imagined such exhibitions in the previous way of working, even in Larry's beautiful space, which we adapted. But here we have the opportunity to really explore a diverse range of ideas. This was our first show with Gajin Fujita, straight out of college. one of many Ken Price shows upstairs. This is a extremely great show we did with Pierre Kirkaby. We made three shows with him. Fred Williams, we were able to bring an artist from Australia. Peter Shaw, this is our celebration of 30 years of being in business. Next is the Four Seasons at East Yorkshire Landscapes, that's right. Now, this is a piece I long to encourage Richard Deacon to make. And uh, this gave the space gave him the opportunity to do so. This is an extraordinary experience to work on this show. 
again, all, all opportunities afforded to by the, by the space that Fred presented us with the opportunity to do. Joel Shapiro did several shows with us here. And this, I think we can argue, helped him break through in a big way with a whole new direction for the work away from the literal figure. This is one of our more glorious shows with the extraordinary Alison Saar. So this gave the art, gives the artist the opportunity to stretch. And you can see it in Gagin's exhibition in 2001. Here's an artist just out of college, used to making small paintings. And here he had the opportunity to stretch and he did, he stepped up. And so that's what spaces like this can do. This exhibition, which Kimberly very much authored by going to uh, New Mexico and with Christina and uh, other colleagues, they assembled a, a survey of Terry Allen's work through his life, starting really at Chenard. It's something else. So this actually is designed on the diagonal. And what it did was it forced the viewer to come into Fred's space and turn right, not left. When you enter most spaces, you go to the left. We read left to right. And in here, we need the people to go right to left because most of the audio components were in this side of the room. And so you could go to each of these works and listen to the audio, which was wired brilliantly by Chris Pate, our preparator, who's been with me almost as long as Kimberly, but not quite. And um, uh, this is how we accomplished this. Fred Space gave us the opportunity to do so. The next images are of the Sky Room, which is this magic room. I don't think we've ever presented, and this is the articulation of how we got to it. And of course, perversely, Here's, here's uh, Ed Moses removing the roof at uh, Rico Mizuno's. We provide the opportunity for him to do something else in that, a space like that. And what does he do? He puts a lid on it. <laughs> so he closes the roof <laughs> and controls the light. Typical uh, Ed Moses' uh, sense of humor. The next one is um, opportunity for a young artist to um, show ceramic work. This is by Matt Weddle, who was a part of our Rogue Wave program, now represented by L.A. Louver extensively, and has his work seen throughout the country. And so we go on to other Skyrim unique experiences, some within the program, like Peter Shelton, and some within the parallel program, which is called Rogue Wave. Starting in 2000, 2000 we begin with Chris Pate curating, we begin a program that goes on for 13 years with five shows, and they are um, a, a, a venue for emerging artists. So this was uh, Olga Kumaduras, who produced this extraordinary uh, show. Other opportunities for the Skyrim are as follows. We can just scroll through them to the marvelous pieces by Allison. Pleased to say the, this space is probably the most successful space in the whole building, actually. And the next one of um, Defers, who is the, um, sorry, the one after this. This is uh, by the artist Defer, Alex Katsu, who is part of uh, the graffiti tradition here in Los Angeles and other parts of the country. but. Uh, Defo is based in Hawaii and here, and he came to us through Gajin Fujita, as he's one of Gajin's crew members in the tagging of his paintings. And this is a, a wonderful experience we've had. We've used it in many, many ways. We have a courtyard which Fred has addressed, and we have given this opportunity to the public to enjoy our space from the outside as well as the inside. Some of these that's artists. My, that's my, that's, that's got to be my favorite. That, I, <clears throat> I, if, you know, you always say, what's your, your favorite space? And you always have to say, well, I love all my children the same. <laughs> this, ro this room is my favorite. <clears throat> it's actually, it, it, it lists as a loading dock, doesn't it, Fred? Um, it's, it's described as a loading dock, the courtyard. Yeah. That's right, exactly. And the reason we have it there is fortunate because the city wanted it in the back. 
Do you mm -hmm. remember that? Then? Yep. Uh, it had been carpeted in the back. Have you been trucks down a one-way street the wrong way? Yep. So <laughs> there's no way to turn the corner. So this enabled us to argue with the city. You know, it had to be from the front. And so in the manner of uh, Larry Bell, which had those big gates, so these gates open up, actually. The posts come out, you can open it up, and you can bring work straight into the front of the gallery. Um, but that entry sequence that you see is offset. So there's the big uh, door on the, le on the right and then the opening on the left. And when you look through the opening, you're confronted with that solid uh, panel of the gray where the, the part of that um, installation is. And then you shift your axis to the right and then go in the door. And that's a classic uh, Japanese uh, uh, tea house uh, circulation uh, motif. Brilliant, Fred. If the next one shows exactly what you're saying precisely. That really does summarize what you've just said. And furthermore, if you come at it obliquely, of course, when you come out of the garage, you actually come out dead center through that vertical window. And of course, before you go slightly left to enter, you actually look right through the building and you see that window that you spotted earlier on at the back of the building. Well, it's 80 foot from the front line, the footprint at the front to the back. But crossing that road is probably how many extra feet do you think that is? Another 20 feet? So at one moment, you're looking 100 feet through from one side of the street to the back to the alleyway at the back. It's rather extraordinary, actually. And then we used it often for performances and presentations, public occasions. So this exhibition sets out not to repeat our history or to grind our past, but to look at some of the iconic things that we associated with in the past, like Keen Holtz, like um, um, uh, Hockney and Kossoff, and they have long, long history of 40 year relationships. And to then anchor that, use those as anchors to look at the emerging artists seen and other artists of established position within the gallery. And that's how this show was curated. Here's an opportunity where we took the entire library out, have it join our archive at uh, Jefferson, which is about 20% of that space, gave us the opportunity to expand our linear footage here. Otherwise a show like 45 artists couldn't possibly be done, but you can see here how healthy that has become in this setting. So this is really the kind of purity Fred was looking for at the beginning, which our way of working in a certain sense denied him. But as we go on, you see it became exactly that. This used to be the uh, room where we had uh, lunch and things like that. So now all of this is opened up for further exhibition prospects. And Fred, I think our building helped you greatly, didn't it, to develop? Uh, well, it did, uh, Peter. And I mean, it was very important to me uh, at the time uh, because of, I thought, the importance of, uh, of the gallery in, in, the, uh, in the art world. And in 1995, uh, Rizzoli published a, a monograph on my work, and I it was it was a very easy decision for me to make to put Ellie Louver Gallery on the cover um, because it represented my investment, engagement, and inspiration uh, in the art world and um, the importance of the Ellie Louver as as a project in our portfolio and also the expression of that you know treating architecture as a as an abstract artwork. Uh, that came out of my conversations with Peter. And so this facade uh, is the cover of my Rizzoli monograph. And that the project led pretty directly to um, some other important projects of ours. You could go next. Um, the Eli Broad Family Foundation, which is not far away in Santa Monica, Ocean Park, which was a conversion of a, I think, 20,000 square foot um, old general telephone building for Eli and Edith Broad uh, for their collection. And uh, the Otis uh, College of Art and Design Galef Studio building, Peter 
uh, was a trustee of Otis for many years as as am I at the at the moment. And um, the uh, creation of a of a flexible uh, gallery for the college and uh, the use of of natural light and that window that captures the view of the sky, bringing it into the art space, all ideas uh, that uh, we were, were sort of uh, uh, fertilized at, at the Louvre Gallery project. Next. Uh, then the Huntington Library, um, a more formal traditional uh, museum space. Uh, here the enfilade galleries uh, of the uh, or Buru Gallery, uh, bringing using the, uh, the the pattern that actually was uh, the floor plan derived from uh, John Soane's Dulwich Picture Gallery outside of London, and the way the skylights are handled in the space, and uh, the proportions of the galleries, and even some of the colors. Next, and then the great PS1. Uh, was called PS1 Contemporary Art Center at the time, and now it's PS1, uh, MoMA PS1, uh, a branch of MoMA, the conversion of a 93,000 square foot turn of the century, and I mean the last century, uh, uh, school building in Long Island City in the borough of Queens. Uh, again, this use of walls to create abstract outdoor exhibit spaces, you can see this is sort of the the grandfather version of the sky room, uh, which they they love. It's a highly active, successful outdoor exhibit program, and uh, where a simple set of walls uh, creates a, a, a palette for the artist to work. I've always been preoccupied and fascinated by this uh, aspect of uh, design. It's held my attention since college. We went to art school when we were 16, my wife and I. And um, this is where these disciplines were put in place. So I think a lot of that dialogue we had was centered in that uh, place, I have a feeling. And I think our interest in education, both of our equal interests in education and community mm -hmm. is very much a part of who you and I are, I'd like to suggest. I, I, I would agree. I mean, the, the Venice, the DNA of being in Venice um, to this day has been a, an essential part of my outlook on art and architecture and community. Uh, uh, and you know, this, this quintessentially California and Los Angeles combination of nature and art and uh, being at the edge of the sea, uh, the mountains within sight and uh, this wonderful bohemian uh, community. It, it's, an, it's an absolutely uh, uh, inspirational community to be in and that it, it had everything to do with what I've uh, been able to achieve and, and wanted to achieve in my career. I agree with you. It's the best choice I ever made was to uh, find a location in Venice. Well, here's where we get to stop and say thank you to everyone for being part of this. Fascinating to be able to have both of you together to look at this rich history that celebrates Venice and Los Angeles and the extraordinary work we've all been able to do. Um, I know that there are a few questions that are out there and we will try and answer them privately to you. And uh, I just say thank you to Peter, thank you to Fred for being with us today. And we look forward to having all of you come visit the exhibition. And I want thank to you, thank Kimberly. all of my colleagues for what's taken place here and the huge, incredible team that we have assembled through these years and the consistency of it all. And as we move forward, we're looking for a very exciting time ahead. Well, Peter, great talking with you. Great to see you. And thank you for the many, many years in, uh, of, of uh, an, of educating me in art and uh, a really inspiring collaboration. Thank you, Fred. You're the best person I could ever imagine working with.